Hi everyone. Today our group will be presenting on Bollum test and to what extent Bollum test is still applicable in UK and Malaysia today. My name is Kelvin Chia. So the lost relationship with medicines has become a highly publicized affair. Cases relating to the rights and responsibilities of doctors and patients feature regularly in the law reports. At every level of medicine practice, law plays a role. Doctors cannot escape the reach of the law. For many medical practitioners, the rise in the number of malpractice claims is the main concern. In order to succeed in a claim of medical negligence, the patients must further prove on a balance of probabilities that the conduct of the doctors falls below the required standard of care. The standard of care, which the law demands on a person in a normal case, has been established to be the standard of reasonable care. If a person achieves the standard satisfied by the hypothetic reasonable man, then he will be not held negligent at common law. However, the formulations of the standard of care required by the medical profession have been a subject of controversy for many years, particularly with regards to the reference point for the standard. The difficulty stems from the basis that the medical negligent cases are a little different from any other normal negligent cases. In a normal case, the court is fully competent to lay down what a reasonable man should do in everyday circumstances because judges are aware of and understand everyday circumstances. As Nori pointed out, in the case of medical negligence, the court may be called upon to measure the reasonableness of medical activity about which the judge has no great level of understanding. The intricacies of medical science are not, generally speaking, within judicial knowledge and this had led to suggestions in case of medical negligence. It should not be left to the courts to lay down the standard to be achieved. The Hunter against Henley case in Scotland, two years before Bollum test was established, had illustrated the same principle. While treating Mrs. Hunter for bronchitis, Dr. Hanley gave a course of penicillin injections. During the 12th injection, the needle broke and part of it was left embedded in her backside. She sued Dr. Hanley alleging negligence. Lord President Clay directed the jury. The true test in establishing negligence in diagnosis or treatment on the part of the doctor is whether he has been proved to be guilty of such failure as no doctor of ordinary skill would be guilty of it acting with ordinary care. The jury returned verdict in favour of Dr. Henley. Although a retrial was ordered on technical grounds, here it was held that in order for a claimant to succeed in establishing a claim for medical negligence against a health professional, all three of the following must be proven. Firstly, that there is a usual and normal practice to be followed. Secondly, that this usual and normal practice was not adopted. And lastly, the cause that the medical professional did adopt was one that no ordinary skilled practitioner in that position would have taken when acting with ordinary care. Hi guys, today I'll be talking about the Bollum's test. My name is Audrey Ng. My student ID is 03400047. This Bollum's test was first established in the case of Bollum against Friend Management Committee in the year 1957. Bollum's test is supported by a ruling made by Justice McNair that a doctor is not guilty of negligence if he has acted in accordance with such a practice accepted as proper by a responsible body of medical men skilled in that particular act. A legal rule of this Bollum's test would be that a doctor is considered negligent when he has failed to act in a way that would be accepted as being appropriate by a competent medical, op medical opinion. And basically, this Bollum's test is applied in a few cases, such as the case of Digimal and Bexley Health Authority in the year 
1995, where even though the defendant had only spent four months practicing as a junior houseman, the courts found that the duration he had practiced as a houseman to be irrelevant to the case. Instead, the courts held the defendant to the standard of a reasonably competent houseman and found him to be negligent. This Bolland's test can also be applied in the case of Sidaway and governors of the Bethlehem Royal and Maudsley Hospitals. The basic facts of this case would be that the defendant failed to inform the plaintiff of the risk which caused the, pla which caused the plaintiff to be paralyzed after the surgery. However, the courts found that there was no negligence on the behalf of the doctor as the doctor as a doctor is only considered negligent when he has failed to act in a way that would be accepted as being appropriate by a competent body of a medical opinion. And so in this way, it applies, it once again reaffirms that the Bolland test is applicable in many cases. However, as time went by, criticisms of the Bolland test arises. One such criticism would be that the test allows professionals to set their own standard in negligent actions. Such in the case of the people other than the professionals that the standard is an objective one, measured only against the reasonable band. However, in this case, the court will decide what the appropriate standard is. Whereas in the case of a professional, the standard is measured subjectively according to what other professionals brought to court as expert witnesses say it is. So the statement made above can be supported by Lord Brown Wilkinson, who referred to the case of Hux and Ho Co., which the court must be, which he quoted that the courts must be vigilant to see whether the reasons given for putting a patient at risk are valid in the light of any well-known advance in the medical knowledge or whether they stem from a residual adherence to an out-of-date idea. Not only that, one of the major criticisms of the Bollum's case will be the fact that it protects professionals to a greater degree than it is the case for anyone else. It is sufficient for a professional to bring to court another fellow professional to say that he would have done the same in the circumstances for the allegation of negligence to fail. One such example of this would be that it is impossible to say what a reasonable, competent body of professional opinion is. In some cases, this can just amount to a question of numbers. This statement can be proven in the case of D. Freitas against O'Brien and Connolly in the year 1995, where the court had held that there was no negligence, despite only 11 out of 1,000 surgeons that claimed that they would carry out this certain procedure in this certain way. However, the court still accepted this small percentage of reasonable bodies and stated that it was still a reasonable body's opinion and stated that it was still reasonable. Hello, my name is Wong Jia Hui. There is a lot of criticism which led to the departure of Bollum Test. In 1998, Lord Brown Wilkinson challenged the authority of Bollum in the case of Bolitor and City and Hackney Health Authority by making a statement that the court are not bound to hold that a defendant doctor escaped liability for negligent treatment or diagnosis just because he leads evidence from a number of medical experts who are genuinely of opinion that the defendant's treatment or diagnosis accorded with sound medical practice. In the case of Polita, the plaintiff who was a two years old boy suffered from serious brain damage and hence had difficulty breathing. At 2.30 p.m., plaintiff suffered total respiratory failure and a cardiac arrest, resulting in severe brain damage. Plaintiff subsequently died. His mother then claimed for negligence on behalf of him as his administrative of his estate. There were several expert witnesses supported the doctor, arguing that the child should have been seen and intubated. And on that basis, the judge found that the doctor had not been negligent. The House of Lords held that the doctor may be negligent even if there is a body of medical opinion on his favour. The doctor must also be able to show that his opinion has a logical basis. However, only very rarely would a judge decide that the opinions of a number or otherwise competent doctors were not reasonably held. And this was not such a case.
In this case, refusing to intubate the child was not illogical, and so there was no breach. So, before Montgomery, a doctor's duty was to warn patients of the risk based on the Bollum's test. Uh, in this case of Montgomery, the court accepted that if Miss Montgomery had been told about the risk of dystocia, that she would have chosen to have a caesarean. Her appeal was successful and the judgment held that the assessment of whether consent was adequate in a clinical negligence claim. The judgment, therefore, means that the doctors must share all material risks as well as any to which it would be reasonable for them to think that the individual patient would attach significance to it. There are key passages from the Montgomery judgment which involves what a patient would consider to be a material risk. One of these passages would be the fact that the doctor is therefore under a duty of care to take reasonable care to ensure that the patient is aware of any material risk involved in any recommended treatment and of any reasonable alternative of variant treatments. Another passage that supports this would be the test of materiality is whether in the circumstances of the particular case, a reasonable person in the patient's position would be likely to attach significance to the risk or the doctor is or should be reasonably aware that the particular patient would be likely to attach significance to it. However, in a limited exception, where the information being given up by the doctor to the patient would be detrimental to the patient's health, the Supreme Court has ruled that it can be withheld. Patients must also have the necessary capacity to give valid consent. In England and Wales, the Mental Capacity Act in the, in, formed in 2005 is used and set out a statutory test which says that to be able to make a decision, the patient must be able to understand information relevant to the decision, retain that information, use or weigh it as part of a decision, and communicate their decision effectively by any means necessary. This MCA makes clear that patients should be presumed to have capacity unless it can be established otherwise. Malaysians follow the UK's common law. The case of Bolland and Friend Hospital Management Committee, Committee is applied and Bolland's test is used to test for medical negligence. In the case of Chin Kiel and Government of Malaysia and another, plaintiff's pla plaintiff was given penicillin injection at a clinic and she died an hour later. The doctor was found negligent because he had failed to act on information where her medical card did show that she was allergic to penicillin. In the High Court, the doctor was held liable in negligence. But the doctor is held not liable by the federal court which stated that a wrong diagnosis per se is no evidence of negligence. However, the decision was overturned by Privy Council which stated that negligence occurs as allergics to penicillin is clearly stated on the patient's card. Next, in the case of Chelia Anak Lelaki Manikam and another in Kerajaan Malaysia, this case involved the failure of a doctor to reveal x-ray causing death of a child. The doctor was found not guilty in the first instant. However, on appeal to the High Court, the High Court allowed the appeal on the following grounds. First, failure on the part of the respondents to reveal the x-ray when there was no time to do so. Second, failure to use diagnostic tests despite its applicability to confirm appendicitis. Third, failure to consider pancreatitis when undertaking the appendectomy. In this case, the, the court stated the law of negligence. To maintain an action in negligence, the plaintiff must established that the doctor owed the patient a duty of care. Also, the, doc the duty was breached and the patient suffered harm caused by the breach. In the case of Kao Nan Seng and Nagama and others, plaintiff involved in an accident and his leg has to be plastered. The doctors did not act on complaints immediately. Gangrene was formed and leg had to be amputated. 
it was held that the duty of the doctor towards his patient must adhere to the re reasonable standard of care and expertise. Defendant is liable as all doctors were, were aware of the fact that if plaster were, was applied, blood circulation would be affected. Doctors were negligent when merely prescribing painkiller when the plaintiff complained of pain too. Hi, I am copywet Samantha. I'll be talking about departure from volume test, which is the case of Rogers VV ticker. It is applied in Malaysia. This is an Australian case. The High Court rejected the volume test to be applied in this case. The plaintiff was almost totally blind in her right eye. The doctor advised her to undergo an operation to improve its appearance and probably restore her vision in her right eye. The operation was failure. Her right eye did not improve. Further, she developed inflammation in the left eye which led to the loss of all of her sight of the left eye. She sued Rogers for negligence. This is because if the plaintiff knew about the risk, she would not have agreed to the surgery. It is noted in the case the plaintiff had keenly asked the doctor about the outcome of the suggested procedure, including the danger of unintended or accidental interference with a good left eye. On the day before the operation, the plaintiff asked the doctor if they could put something to cover her good eye to ensure that nothing happened to her good eye. In this case, it was held that the doctor did not conduct negligently although the sight of her right eye did not improve. Campbell J found the defendant liable that he had failed to tell the plaintiff that she might, as a result of the operation, develop a condition known as sympathetic ophthalmia in her left eye. The doctor should have recognized and attached significance to the relevance of a patient's question. Therefore, the defendant is held liable. It must be noted that this case is not applicable in the UK. In Malaysia, there is a case, Kamalan Anak Perempuan Raman and Ardus and Eastern Plantation Agency Sendiran Bahad. This case applied for Roger V. Whitaker. It was fully endorsed in Malaysia for the first time, and this case is not bound by the Bolon principle. The fact is, the deceased complained of giddiness and had fainted in work. He was attended to by the defendant where he was examined and prescribed medication and subsequently discharged. He was again examined by the defendant's doctors on two other occasions. The last time he was examined by the defendant's doctor, the disease was admitted to the hospital as a result of giddiness and fits. The disease died at the hospital the next day. The doctor failed to diagnose the plaintiff's ailment, which turned out to be a stroke. He also failed to admit the plaintiff into the hospital and thereby causing his death. He should have referred the disease to hospital because the manifested symptoms of an impending stroke. Therefore, the defendant is held guilty. Apart from this, there is also a case which is Fu Fiona and Dr. Su Fokman. This case shows full reception of Whitaker's test. Fufiona was involved in a car accident and she had bruises on the lower abdominal wall, right breast, and the both anterior iliac spine areas. She also suffered close dislocation C4 and C5 vertebrae with bilaterally locked facet. An orthopedic surgeon performed a surgery where the dislocated vertebrae were moved on their normal positions and secured by the bone grafting and insertion of a loop of wire. The wire loop was found to be the cause of total paralysis of the patient by pressing on the spinal cord. As a result of this, the first respondent performed a second operation on her on the same day, whereby he removed the wire loop, but this treatment did not remove the paralysis and she continued 
to be confined to a wheelchair. Although the patient signed the consent form, the patient claimed that she was not informed of the risk of paralysis from the particular surgery. The court found that the doctor was negligent in failing to inform her of the risk. Hi, I'm Faith and I'm going to be talking about the UK's position on the application of the Bullen test, the Belitho test and the Montgomery test. The practical standard of care for doctors is set by the usage of the Bolum test. However, the outcome of the Bolum test is merely persuasive because post belitho it is established that the final decision is made by the court. And this means that the courts are placed in a more inquiring position where they are to logically analyse the actions of the defendant doctor. Now, with the application of belitho, the court doesn't just look at the validity of a certain treatment, but also how valid the act of rejecting other forms of treatment is. Now, this implies that just because the Bolum test approved the actions of the defendant, this doesn't necessarily mean that it was what the doctor should have done. The court will study components such as the size of the risk. They will also look at how alternative treatments rank in terms of risk, the seriousness of potential consequences, the ease by which potential risk might be, so uh, might be avoided, and the implications of such avoidance in terms of finances and the resources of healthcare. So basically, the Bolum test cannot stand alone and has to be accompanied by Belitho. And when the case involves consent, this is where the Montgomery test would come in. Now, the application of the, of the Montgomery test is a bold move away from heavily defending medical practitioners and towards patient-centered care, where the standard of care involves informing the patient of potential risks, um, empath empathizing with what they would like to know, and giving them the right to choose if they'd like to go with a particular form of treatment. Cases that have demonstrated the application of the Belitho test are seen in, one of, in, in the case of Pierce and United Bristol Healthcare. In this case, it was questioned whether a 0.1 to 0.2% risk of stillbirth was a significant enough risk to inform the patient of. Now, doc doctors said that this risk was not significant enough, but due to the reasonable patient test where it says that if a risk is significant enough that it would affect the judgment of the patient, it is the doctor's duty to inform the patient of the risk. Hence, the defendant was held liable for failing to provide proper advice. In the case of Marriott and West Midlands Regional Health Authority and others, the hospital's failure to properly treat Marriott's head injury brought the general practitioner to court. And despite the body of professionals approving the treatment that he was given, the judge was not obligated to accept the opinion because of insufficient logic. And this was that the doctor didn't follow proper procedures to identify the more serious injury. Had he identified the injury, the hospital at that time was also properly equipped to treat that injury appropriately. A case that involves the application of the Montgomery test would be seen in Spencer and Hillingdon NHS Trust, where the patient wasn't informed of potential risks after a hernia operation as well as the injurious symptoms he might have afterwards. So when he unknowingly contracted this injury, he wouldn't have known to seek help, and failure to advise him for this was a breach of duty. So after all that has been said about Bolum and Bolitho and Montgomery, there are still some significant drawbacks and benefits that come together with the application of all of these. The application of, of Bolitho and Montgomery to complement Bolum is good because Bolum is not sufficient to cover issues on consent because then it will move the power of making ethical judgments to doctors which weakens the power of the court. So, for example, in, the, in situations where patients are not able to give valid consent, it shouldn't be left to the doctors to decide standard of care because this would involve the issue of ethics and morals. Um, basically, issues regarding evidence and practice is where doctors can have a say, and this is the application of the Bolum test. But consent and morals should be for the court to deliberate on. Another benefit of, of the application of Belitho and the Montgomery test is that it also moves treatment to be more patient-centered. So where doctors previously had the upper hand, there is now focus on what patients would want, with increased efforts in giving patients enough information that they would want that they would be able to make educated decisions in how they want to be treated. Now, these are the draw these are the drawbacks. Um, the application of, of the Montgomery test and the Belitho test to complement the Bolum test might also encourage defensive medicine, 
where a doctor excessively diagnoses a patient, which ironically leads to protecting doctors instead of directing the focus to what patients would want. And then there's also the floodgates argument where people might want to claim for past actions. Where the Montgomery test also lacks is addressing situations where an emergency has emerged. And this is seen in, in cases of, of birth giving. These are also situations where there isn't just where there just isn't enough time to ask a patient for consent on whether the doctor should proceed with a certain treatment or, or cause of action. The doctor has to has to act immediately. It is argued that these situations would be exempt from the Montgomery test and falls back on the Belitho test, where it is up to the court to decide whether the doctor's decision was right in that moment. So these are some gaps that the application of Bolam, Belitho, and Montgomery have left in medical law. The first one is that the implementation of, of Montgomery principles is an issue and it's hard to supervise. This is seen in where the Medical Defense Union and the Medical Protection Society both have made statements making reforms to require procedure. But um, other associations like the GMC and Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists have yet to do so. So this leads to the question of whether hospitals are even working towards informing patients patients of risk. Another gap that this has left is that courts now have to follow three different tests and the lines defining whether a case involves consent may also be blurred, which may lead to inconsistent and even unjust applications of the Montgomery test because of no proper def definition of what constitutes an informed consent case. All right, as to the extent of the application of Rogers and Whitaker and the Bolum test. Uh, well, there's been a shroud of confusion regarding both of these tests ever since the case of Fufiona. And this could be addressed in an article written by Kumara Lingam, Amrita Lingam, in the Singapore Academy of Law Journals. So, in this article, he stated that there are three reasons for the confusion um, that shrouded these two tests. The first one would be that the federal court judgment in Fu Fiona was itself ambiguous on whether its rejection of Bollum was limited to the duty to inform or was more general. And it's significant to note that Fu Fiona has been interpreted in the case of Surrender Singh against Lee Man Kei as rejecting the Bollum with respect to all aspect of neck medical negligence. Now, the second reason for this confusion was that Malaysian courts have not adhered strictly to the doctrine of precedence, and this could be seen in the Court of Appeal case of Dominic Potucheri against Dr. Gun Siu Fong, which established that the Bollum test had been rejected as a general proposition. Now, the third reason for this confusion is that there was no theoretical basis for the decision of Fufiona, which adhered simply to choose between Bollum and Rogers. And all of this confusion has been going on until the case of Zul Hasnimar Hassan Basri against Dr. Kupul Velu Mani. Now, in this case, the federal court has clarified the doubt surrounding the proper applicable test in determining standard of care and medical negligence by making the following observations. Rogers and Whitaker was entirely concerned with the duty to advise and specific reference was made to this fact in Fu Fiona. Thus, the decision in Fu Fiona must necessarily be limited only to the duty to advise of risks, as it did not address the standard of care expected in respect of either diagnosis or treatment. Thus, in respect of the standard of care in medical negligence cases, a distinction must be made between diagnosis and treatment on one hand and the duty to advise risks on the other because medical experts do genuinely and frequently differ in opinion on diagnosis and treatment. Therefore, it is not a matter that the court are equipped to resolve. In this context, the Bolum test makes sense. However, the duty to advise relates to the right of self-determination. It is the court which will decide whether a patient has been properly advised of the risks associated with a proposed treatment. As such, the test in Rogers is strictly restricted to the duty to advise of risk, whereas the Bollum test applies to the standard of care for diagnosis or treatment. 
Now the benefits to the Rogers and Whittaker test is that in regards to the duty to disclose risk, medical opinion would not be the only factor that is taken into account of the judgment. In fact, it will be one of the factors taken into account by the courts. However, one of the drawbacks was mentioned by Gopa Sri Ram in the case of Dr. Su Fukman against Fu Fiona. He stated that if the law played to interventionist a role in the field of medical negligence, it would lead to the practice of defensive medicine. The cost of the men on the street would become prohibitive without necessarily being beneficial. In conclusion, the Bollum test in the UK is combined with the Bolito test, in which the judges would consider the body of medical opinions as long as they are logical. Now, for the duty to disclose, the Montgomery test will apply. In Malaysia, the Bollum test is applied in cases regarding duty to diagnose and duty to treat.